Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session Best Practices for Multicluster Observability Lessons Learned. My name is Vanessa Martini, and today I'm joined by Roger Florian to give you a glimpse of what we have recently learned dealing with uh, multi-cluster environments, different customers, and a growing number of open source projects in the observability space. But before getting started, a quick intro. So as I said, my name is Vanessa. I am an observability product manager at Red Hat, uh, working on analytics and UI topics for OpenShift. Yes, hello everybody. My name is Roger Florin. I'm also a PM for the observability field, focusing on in-cluster stacks, power monitoring, and also some new work we are doing with multi-cluster observability. Thank you, Roger. So let's take a look at the agenda of today's session. First of all, we will start by reflecting on the importance of observability, especially in multi-cluster environments. We will then identify the major challenges of dealing with such environments. And these reflections will lead us to the heart of today's presentation, which is our lessons learned. What did we learn from all these challenges and what do we recommend to you all? And lastly, we will end the presentation with an overview of what's next. Hot topics and future predictions in the multi-cluster observability space, according to our opinion, of course, humble opinion. So stay tuned for that. But without further ado, let's get started with uh, our introductory section, observability and multi-cluster environments. I would like to start by asking you in the audience one question. How many of you make use of banking products and services? Raise your hand if you do. Without any surprises, the majority of us, if not all of us. So what do I mean here with uh, banking products and services? I'm talking about uh, all those financial offerings that target individuals, but also enterprises and institutions. They include deposit accounts, loans and credits, investment and insurance products, um, advisory services, as well as digital banking services, just to mention a few, to give you an example. Now, imagine what would happen if the access to all these services would be suddenly terminated or temporarily suspended. What would that mean for us as individuals, but also for the organizations dealing with such banks? So no more transaction processing, no more payments, uh, no more credit card access, no real-time fraud detection. That would mean utter total chaos, disaster. And that's where observability becomes essential, especially multi-cluster observability. Uh, so, to keep up with constantly evolving customer needs, banks and other organizations need to face substantial digital transformations to this day, to be, to be able to uh, deliver new features faster, and thus to be able to reach new markets faster, to be able to be competitive in today's global economy. And for this reason, banks are adopting more and more multi-cluster architectures to be able to improve their own IT performance, resilience, scalability, and generally to really uh, effectively manage their workloads better. That's why those organizations, especially the ones facing these digital transformations, decide to deploy different components of their applications across multiple clusters so that critical services, especially the customer-facing applications, always remain operational, up and running, no matter if one cluster goes down. So, based on this talk context, how can observability be defined? Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, so we really like this quote, and I will read it out to you, that observability is a system property that defines the degree to which the system can generate actionable insights. Okay. This quote, I think, really perfectly encapsulates the essence of observability. It's not just about collecting the data, it's also about transforming that data to actionable insights. Think of it like this way, that your multi-cluster environment is like it's a vast landscape, observability is only is also the map the compass and it's also like the binoculars that allow you to navigate and understand that landscape so in other words observability as you know comprised by these metrics logs and traces allows you to answer any question that you might have about a running system and it will help you resolve those issues with it in the system and optimize it so with observability, you can like pinpoint the source of problems quickly. You, know, you have to dig through all the logs. You can predict and prevent issues before they impact users. Like it will give you the foresight to identify potential issues. You also have the possibility to optimize and perform 
the performance and the efficiency of the clusters. By understanding how this works, you can fine tune them for maximum performance. And one key thing is that you need to make informed decisions, like data-driven decisions will always be better than guessing. So observability will provide you with the data you need to make the right choices. Imagine yourself being a pilot of this aircraft. You're responsible for safety navigating a complex machine through the skies. To do this, you need clear, concise, and timely information. The same is almost true for managing a multi-cluster environment. But it's a complex machine, it's a complex system with countless moving parts, and without the right information at the right time, it's easily to feel overwhelmed. So in a cockpit like this, pilots rely on carefully designed instruments like essential gauges, warning lights, communication systems. So the goal in a multi-cluster environment is to create a similar cockpit view of your multi-cluster, like a single pane of glass that gives you the most relevant information at the right time. So this way you can focus on the big picture, make informed decisions, respond quickly, and then when any issue arises, just like a pilot, you can confidently use this complex system and ensure a smooth flight for your users and your customers. So how do we do this? This diagram, I think, illustrates very well how a virtuous cycle of observability, a continuously feedback loop that drives the improvement in your multi-cluster environment. You start at the top with a better visibility. You start by adding observability to your cluster. And that's the ability to see what's happening within your system. That means collecting data from all the layers, from the applications, metrics, logs, traces, events, maybe even profiling. With this better visibility, you will get better understanding of your cluster to make sense of the data, identifying patterns, correlations, root causes, and that will then give you a better system. Your system, then you can take those insights and optimize your applications, your infrastructure, your processes. You can also make informed decisions about the resource allocation, the capacity planning. And to further improve your cluster, you can start and then do better instrumentation. And this will help you like even make granular changes to it. You can ensure that you're collecting the right things to get the full picture. And that, in the end, we're back to the beginning. That will give you better visibility yet again. To complete the cycle you get into your system, you're able to detect issues earlier, you resolve them faster, and ultimately build a more reliable and resilient system. So the cycle is never ending, I would say. It's a continuous improvement. And it's driven by data and insights. So as we have seen, observability holds like a lot of promises for gaining insights. But let's be realistic. It's not super easy. And the road to observability in a multi-cluster environment is not without its bounds. So it prevents a unique set of challenges. It can make it hard to achieve. They stem for like the, just the sheer complexity of the multi-cluster and the scale of a distributed system. So in the next few slides, we will present some challenges that we have seen. So, and we think that the organization will face these and trying to implement this observability in the multi-cluster environment. So, thank you, Roger. So, I would like to talk about challenge number one. So, we have four challenges here. Building one single pane of glass or one unified view across all your clusters. Why is that tricky? So, uh, first of all, clusters can be distributed across different geographical locations, but also operating in multi-cloud and hybrid cloud environments, which may lead to discrepancies not only in policies, but also in configurations. Second of all, as the number of clusters increases, the volume of our data, the data that we need to handle, exponentially increases. And this is a point that we will repeat quite a lot in this presentation, so just a warning. Therefore, having full data visibility may become quite tricky. So think about tracking the functionality of thousands and thousands of dashboards, each one of them tracking a specific component or a set of metrics. That's definitely not a piece of cake. On top of this, observability signals may have different data formats or schemas, which makes the um, normalization but also unification, correlation of this data hardest to do, especially if collected from multiple clusters. So this complicates even more the data analysis process. So to have this comprehensive comprehensive view of my cluster's health. 
And this leads me to challenge number two, which is alert noise and increased troubleshooting complexity. So as I mentioned earlier, as the number of my clusters increases, the noise generated from data itself naturally increases as well. So um, I think this means that focusing on actually the diagnostic data, the diagnostic information that matters um, becomes even more difficult. Let's think about alerts, which are rules that fire when specific thresholds are being crossed. So interestingly, when we look at our own platform, uh, the majority of those alerts result to have a warning status. So this makes the detection of critical incidents a harder task. So on top of this, think about uh, um, not having access to any automated incident response tools to manage this alert noise or data noise in general. This would result in a lot of manual efforts and a lot of a huge cognitive load for all your colleagues, my colleagues as well, trying to troubleshoot cluster issues. So this is challenge number two. Yeah, if we continue on challenge number three, that's another major challenge, and that is how do you handle resource control? Like managing resources across multiple clusters, trying to conduct, it's, it's something like conducting like a symphony, but the problem is that each magician is in each room, and each, they have their own instrument in another room. It's, so it's a complex undertaking that requires coordination. So the complexity of these multi-cluster environments is much like managing this large fleet that, will that leads to an increased risk of overhead cost. You need to monitor and optimize this. And the resource utilization across these clusters can quickly become a time-consuming and expensive task. So additionally, like the capacity planning becomes much more complex. You need to forecast demand. You need to allocate resources across these multiple clusters, taking into account like varying workloads. It can be seasonal fluctuations, like depending on customers and what happens in the world and also unexpected events. So take, to make more informed decisions about resource allocations, you need to have sufficient granularity of information and also some kind of data transparency. You need to be able to drill down into these clusters to the individual ones and see exactly how the resources are being used, where bottlenecks can be occurring and where the optimization opportunities can be next. So without proper Resource control, you can easily fall into the trap of over-provisioning in your clusters, leading to unnecessary costs. Or maybe the worst thing is to under-provision. That would result in performance issues and probably unhappy users. The last challenge we have looked at is something scalability and governance. And for scalability, we're back to this, that you must be a able to handle the increasing volume of data that's generated by a growing number of clusters and the applications that are sending all the data. It should be able to scale both horizontally and vertically without sacrificing the performance and the reliability. If we look at the governance aspect, it's also like with multiple teams, you will have stakeholders involved in managing the clusters. You need to establish some kind of clear process and profiles for this observability. This includes defining the roles, responsibilities, setting standards, data collection, retention, ensuring that you have compliance, both with security and privacy. So what will happen if you fail on this? Like you risk data overload, your observability tools will become overwhelmed just by the sheer amount of volume of data, leading to slowdowns, errors, missed insights, Inconsistency practices is like different teams in different locations may adopt this observability differently, resulting in inconsistently data collection, fragmented views, also difficulty in troubleshooting. Security and compliance, like imagine without any governance, you can have a lot of security vulnerabilities and potential breaches of data. And maybe one thing that you don't think of is that it can also bring slower innovation. If you cannot track the metrics and things you have in your clusters, then the ability to scale that can also hinder your organization's ability to innovate and adopt new technologies. So what have you learned from this? As Vanessa mentioned at the beginning, we learned that the unified view is paramount. We need to break down the silos and consolidate data to gain the insights. We learned that alert fatiguing 
is a real threat. You need to prioritize alerts, reduce noise, and probably automate as much as possible. We also learned that resource control is essential. You need to monitor, manage, optimize your resources, and scalability and governance. Like We need to build systems that can grow with us and establish clear rules for our observability data. This is, of course, just a few of the lessons or challenges we have seen. So in the next section, we will look into some lessons learned. So we have seen all these four challenges, but the good news is we have also learned something out of those, as Roger has said. And we have two major lessons. Let's start with lesson number one, which is the importance of navigating the growing CNCF landscape and generally the open source landscape. So we also go beyond the CNCF, so Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Okay, as we dig deeper into this uh, multi-cluster of observability, we of course cannot ignore the vast landscape of CNCF. Uh, CNCF has played a crucial role in how we foster open source innovation. And as you know, this landscape is vast, it's ever evolving, so you, how do you track all these products like in different aspects of observability? Like everybody knows like the monitoring, we have Prometheus and it's somewhat a de facto standard at the moment, but everything changes. It also has projects like Grafana, Cortex coming out, Thanos for storage. On the logging side, we have Fluent, Fluent Bit, Loki for aggregation, tracing. We have also, I think we have Jaeger there in Sipkin, and also, of course, Open Telemetry. That's a, like standardized. So this is just a scratch of this surface, and there are many other projects within CNCF landscape that will contribute to building more and more robust observability solutions. So one of the more powerful lessons we've learned is that this incredible value of open source bring to the table, like projects that we use, like Prometheus, Open Telemetry, and Grafana, they are not just buzzwords. These are actually tools that we use as a, to a successfully provide these observability implementations. So why do we think that you should focus on open source. There are a couple of things. It's cost effective. Open source tools eliminate the expense for licensing fees, allowing you to invest, take those resources and those costs to other areas. The flexibility of it. You can have your freedom to modify all the open source to your, your unique feel. And community, like open source projects, normally have a vibrant community of contributors, and that will drive the innovation and help everybody. And of course, vendor neutrality. You're not locked in to different vendors, proprietary solutions. It will give you more control. But how do you maximize the value of this open source? Like if you invest in some kind of expertise, like allocate resources to train your team and or hire experts who can help you get the most of the things done. Contribute back. Like participate in community, report bugs, contribute with code and documentation because it will help everybody. Integrate strategically. What we mean by that is don't follow just a stream. Try and find the right combination of tools for your specific needs and then try and seamlessly integrate that into your workflow. And of course, as everybody's here, stay informed. Go to conferences. Keep up with the latest development in open source to take advantage of the new innovation and things that are coming. Thank you, Roger. So we have seen the data collection and storage layers. We have seen also Prometheus OpenTelemetry, um, Grafana Loki. Um, but when building a single pane of glass, this cockpit view that we have seen at the beginning, the visualization portion is key. That's why I'd like to um, give a bit of a spotlight to Perses. Perses is an upstream community founded in Amadeus a few years ago, fully focusing on um, observability visualization needs, making it an alternative to Grafana. So its starting point was supporting Prometheus, but it's giving everybody the chance to contribute code to account for additional data sources. So Red Hat Observability has recently contributed to add the traces. So you may wonder, why not Grafana, why Perses? So 
through purses, it's possible to easily modify and also create charts as it allows to define dashboards as code uh, in a GitOps friendly um, way. Note that, for example, Grafana data model is not always really made for dashboards as a code. So on top of this, uh, Perses is easily embeddable uh, with uh, NPM packages, and it also supports plugins such as data source, panel, variable, and query. So all those features together, thanks to them, it's easier to integrate charts uh, in your own UI and also platform. And that's exactly what we are doing for Red Hat OpenShift Web Console. So this is an example of the charts uh, currently supported by Perses that includes, for example, gate charts, time series charts, markdown panels. So editable panel options are also available. And as I said before, Red Hat Observability has also been working on integrating Perses power uh, charts in the OpenShift Web Console. So for now, the single cluster experience, a first step has been to create and embed a Perses powered scatter plot as part of the brand new tracing UI, uh, which is being released in a few weeks. And now let's talk about the data analytics layer. We have seen the data collection, storage, visualization layer that provides us an overview uh, of our cockpit. However, the data analytics layer to be able to explore this data and filter noise out, it's very important. So I would like to give a spotlight also to Correlator, which is an open source project founded within the Red Hat Observability Group. So it is designed to correlate metrics, logs, cluster alerts, Kubernetes resource, and additional observability signals from multiple heterogeneous um, data stores, such as Prometheus and Loki. So I want to say that it's not yet part of the CNCF landscape, uh, but it's a useful solution for those organizations that need to manage complex multi-cluster environments because it reduces the overall troubleshooting time on clusters and it allows to correlate signals with different schemas and query languages from different technologies, as I said before. So, I'd like to mention also that uh, the heart of Correlator is its rules. Correlator uses a set of extendable rules that describe relationships between observability signals. For example, given a start signal, which is a domain in Correlator, for example, an alert in an cluster, and a goal, for example, my goal is to find the related logs to that specific alert, the Correlator engine searches for the goal data that is related to the start signal by some chain of rules. So those rules makes Correlator a powerful tool, but also flexible as rules can be added. So we also find Correlator user-friendly at is embeddable in graphical interfaces. So today Correlator is in fact integrated in the OpenShift web console and it's supporting signals such as metrics, logs, Kubernetes resources, as I said, alerts, and also net flows. Traces is work in progress. So visualization-wise, this is an example of how Correlator works on an OpenShift cluster, so displayed in the OpenShift web console. So as you can see here, the Correlator output is rendered uh, in a troubleshooting side panel. So feature that will be also released in a few weeks, uh, like I mentioned before, the tracing UI. By clicking on each icon or node in the side panel, you are directed to the relevant information and UI. So the troubleshooting panel is actually uh, interactive. So you can go from an alert, as you can see here, looking at the uh, green line, to its equivalent metric, uh, but also to its relevant pod, to its relevant logs, uh, events, as you can see from the slide. So to sum up, Correlator is able to improve the overall troubleshooting experience, as I said earlier. Its ability to correlate different observability signals helps users to quickly identify root causes of issues as it can go directly to, from an alert, to its relevant log. Yes, and we want to continue on looking at some open source communities. Well, like, the innovation doesn't stop. Like, so one open source project that continue to push the boundaries is like Kepler. Kepler, for example, is now in the CNCF sandbox. It leveraged the power of eBPF to probe performance counters and use machine learning models to estimate the energy consumption of your workloads. So Kepler can then export these statistics as Prometheus metrics on seamlessly integrating into your existing monitoring infrastructure. Like Kepler, I think, demonstrates how open source initiatives can take specific challenges in the world, in this case, resource efficiency and sustainability, and then push that into a product that will continue and grow 
So it's, I think it's a testament to some innovation within the open source community. And I think we have some slides. Vanessa will show you some UI from this. So uh, this is an example of Kepler also in the OpenShift Web Console. So the dashboard UI. Here, uh, this is the overview uh, page that we have as shown at the top of the screen. Um, we start by looking at the overall total energy consumption over the last 24 hours. Scrolling down in the middle of the slide, uh, you can see the list of the namespaces that are contributing the most to the overall energy consumptions. And users can also access more detailed information, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, uh, at the node level. So, drilling down even more, and switching here to the namespace view, it's possible to see the total energy consumption in a specific namespace in watts and kilowatts by, uh, per hour by selecting your own time range, in this case, the last 30 minutes. And lastly, last slide, um, it's, yeah, it's on tendy here, so it's possible to dig even more uh, details per container. So here I highlighted the top contributions for both um, PKG and drum power consumption. And what can we say about Kepler? All in all, is a great addition, as Roger has said, uh, to, for better resource control uh, as the number of clusters increases. So a great starting point to enable sustainability tracking. So another lesson we learned is when talking to customers is customers are very different. And the multi-cluster ability is not, as we said, just about collecting data. It's about also efficiently configuring your tools and system to work seamlessly across your clusters. So based on all this information, we cannot define a clear objective for our multi-cluster story. And as these, guide, these strategies will guide us to our decision making and help us build a solution that we truly meet the organization. Customer flexibility, why do we mean by that? Our customers operate in a diverse environment with varying needs, so we must offer them the flexibility to choose the signals that matter most to them, depending on the clusters they have, or maybe even different applications in different clusters. So the solution needs to be adaptable with different infrastructure setups, whether it's on-premise, cloud-based, some hybrid, in, it should seamlessly integrate with the technologies in the platform. It has to be cost-effective. We want to avoid unnecessary costs, no overhead and complexity. You need to strive to maximize, the, like to use the single cluster solutions whenever possible, rather than introducing a lot of new tools. And we talked about this single pane of glass, the single pane control. Like Our goal is to provide some kind of unified view of the entire multi-cluster environment. The single pane of glass should make it easy for the operators and engineers to monitor, to troubleshoot, and manage all the cluster from run central locations. So it's not just about technology. You need to empower your teams, serving your customers, and somehow drive that efficiency. So one goal we have that we're working on is we want to strengthen our single cluster story, like the OpenShift container platform, to gradually change to be a consistent experience also into the advanced cluster management, like the ACM. That's Red Hat's multi-cluster management solution that we don't need for the slide. So how do we do this? We need to be able to push signals from the single clusters, like metrics, logs, traces, maybe even network solutions, profiles, power monitoring, continuous profiling, things like that. And this is a challenge, so we will see what's happening in the future. So, it's clear, we love open source. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> so what's next? So again, a summary first. We have learned that building this single pane of glass is the goal of any solid multi-cluster observability solution, and that's also our goal in Red Hat. Um, so we have the collection and storage layers, uh, where key to collect and store, but also aggregate relevant observability data. Uh, the analytics layer to filter the data noise out, and the visualization layer to easily access this one unified view of the health of these clusters, which are multiple, as we said several times. So, we have seen that open source is for us the way forward. However, there is no one size fits all open source solution. So choosing specific projects over others may be advantageous uh, for different reasons. 
That is why before making any decisions, weighting priorities uh, is essential. So are you looking for scalability? Or are you looking to prioritize flexibility to your users? We need to ask ourselves these questions. We have also seen that value is not only added by graduated projects in the CNCF landscape, but emerging solutions such as Correlator and Persis, um, not yet officially part of the CNCF landscape. So it's important to keep an eye also on those as they can solve complex problems also with a more simple approach. And as the observability space is evolving, what can we expect next? So here, our last predictions. Yeah, we tried to figure out how is the future of multi-cluster observability. And we think it's bright. New technologies and approach and emerging that will empower us to be more resilient. So the trends for 2024 and beyond is like more focus on edge clusters, we think. Real-time processing and low latency. So this decisions has to be made quickly, like based on these real-time data on the edge. Expect. I think, an increase in tools that will have this real-time analytics between on-edge devices, allowing for faster troubleshooting. Uh, defining the role of traces. Traces is a rising technology, but as you know, it's also costly if you're going to do it in a large scale. So I think we will see a great number of solutions coming where we solve this problem. AI-based insights. Predictive AI. AI can analyze historical data very good and identify patterns that precede performance degradation. So these machine learning models can probably learn from the past incidents and predict if you're going to have any potential outages. We need an industry standard for data. Like that's, we need to talk the same language. Imagine having correlator or analytics and we have different data schemas that will make think that defining observability requirements through infrastructure is cold will solve on the rise. We have that now when we're building infrastructure, but also having that for observability, I think is something that's coming. More fo focus on cost management and sustainability tooling with AI on the rise, a lot of power will cost a lot of money and you need to bring down the power. More focus on automated remediation, like Analyze complex data sets, automatically identify the root cause, saving valuable teams. I think that is up and running. So, as we looked into the challenges and lessons of multi cluster observability, one thing is clear observability is no longer a luxury, but it's a necessity. So, it's a continuous process of learning, adapting, and improving this. So, try and embrace the open source community explore these new tools and um, strive for a deeper understanding because understand that observability is, is a journey, it's not a destination. And you also have a cute dog picture. Thank you so much. We are open for questions even though there is not much time, but you can reach out for us uh, later in the all. Thank you so much.